Final sixth study, perhaps the most challenging, all based on chords and chordal positions and being able to move the positions between chords without ever looking down at the hand. In other words, doing everything by feel. The way this is going to work is pretty much like this. You shape the first chord and then you recognize that the next position down an octave is the exact same position. So how does one actually find this next position with confidence? One thing that helps is to recognize that these octave positions allow us to feel one note with, let's say, the thumb, which will also be felt with the other finger, namely finger five. Or vice versa, if you are down here and you're feeling a certain note with finger five, well, that same note is going to be there for finger one when you move. And so this awareness of the shared notes is one of the main principles when it comes to building up that confidence in motion. So first and foremost, without so much worrying about every single note, just recognizing that the two outside notes frame the position and it's important to learn to move your hand between those two positions without looking down, doing it by feel, and being always aware that, hey, right now, finger five is on some note, I'm about to put finger one there. And so at the beginning, you might even do some of this sort of position adjustment, where you kind of bring your hand together to make it smaller, and then you find this note towards which you're going and then you expand the hand back out and we did something similar i think it was study four which also had a lot of chords but in this particular study it's all about doing that and so as soon as you feel that your hand is simply able to do this without needing that deliberate compression of the hand expansion of the hand just try to do it with confidence, without any hesitation. If you miss, well, then you know you need to do it a little more carefully. If you maybe don't go far enough, well, go a little further. But that sensation of going between positions is very important to master this particular etude. So, once you've done the outside notes, the octave, now comes the time of actually adding the other fingers and feeling that not only do you adjust your outside fingers to the bracketing position, the octave position, but you're also putting the long fingers on the appropriate keys as well. Again, I'm sitting pretty far down, but I feel it's not far enough, so I'm gonna keep moving so that my nose is yeah, pretty much against the F natural below C, below middle C. So that seems like a comfortable reach for my hand, even though it means I might have some struggles towards the end of the piece, but that to me is much easier to do than to go across my torso midline and try to find notes down below when I'm not given enough room with my torso. Okay, so let's try this. We're holding the first position. And then we're learning to do this shift. And once again, you notice that I've completely missed. Why? Because I was not actively aware of where my first finger is. Good. Now I definitely placed my fifth finger on my reference point. You can almost think about this as being the anchor point. But now we're not just keeping one finger on that anchor point. We are substituting first finger for the fifth finger and back and forth and back and forth. So that awareness is obviously the most important thing. Being aware which key is shared. Right? And that means that once you orient yourself towards feeling the fifth finger first, 
other fingers will follow to try to recreate that same shape that they felt up here. Right, so first you find the position and then you simply execute what's written in it. Beat two. And I'm about to play beat three. Guess what I'm about to have to do? I'm going to hit this, this staccato chord and which, which is my awareness finger? It's finger five. I'm feeling it on E flat and I know I'm about to play finger one there. There it is. And so as, as soon as I do this, finger one goes in the appropriate spot. Other fingers just expand naturally out because it's the same here, it's the same there, right? So one more time, the whole measure. First, jump from first finger to the fifth finger on the same key, right? And you can see I landed on the fifth finger, but my third kind of got stuck on D flat there. Well, it's not a big deal because I know it's a D flat because I know my fifth finger is on E flat. All I do is I slip it back down one more time. Right, I even hit some white keys there accidentally. Same thing happened. I, it's easier for the third finger to rest above on the black keys, but I need it to be here. So I'm just going to keep practicing until this is solid. Let's hit this note a little bit, but now I made sure that not only my fifth is on the right key, the third is on the right key as well. Same thing, I managed to get the E flat covered with five, but third finger is still on D flat. Not a big deal, because even if I did that in performance, as I start playing through B2, well, okay, all I have to do is slip the third finger down. So, first and foremost, be aware of those shared notes. Let's keep going. I'm still in the same position. Instead of playing one, two, three, five, I'm playing one, two, four, five. Now, after the last beat of measure two, slight adjustment of the second finger, right? Nothing else. Same thing. I'm going from this chord, downbeat of three, measure three, down here. Well, this time it was good, but first time it was more like this. I got stuck on that D flat. I got stuck on the B flat. It's okay. As long as my outer bracket is correct, adjusting the inner fingers is really a piece of cake. Just take your time. Don't try to, you know, try to panic and try to do it all at once. Just step by step. Measure three. Now I'm going to keep going up, but the chord is still the same. So awareness that as I'm going up, I need to orient my focus on to the fifth finger because that's where I'm going to be putting my first. And now I'm about to play the last measure in this line and I'm going to go back down. So it's the thumb that is now being the focus of my attention right same thing i'm kind of not so clean with my long fingers yet but at least i'm getting that outer bracket and i know i can adjust just like that all right so now i'm going to move the view and i'm about to go from measure four into measure uh, five now i'm not sure what that number seven is it might be page seven from the big score so don't be confused by that measure five next line is this chord so i'm modulating or i'm shifting my uh key from what was it kind of e flat major here to seems like b major uh but the fingering is the same. I'm only going up one to the next black key. So that's kind of the easy shape. I don't need to look down to check it. I, I focus on moving my outside fingers to the next to the next black key up from E flat, the F sharp. And then I work on making sure that two and three 
are also in the right position. Okay. Once I feel this shape, it's the exact same uh, practice pattern and uh, performance pattern as in the first line. I'm aware of the first finger. I'm about to move down. I'm about to jump down without looking at my hand. Right, so again, I'm very much focused on the fifth finger. I completely screwed up my second finger. You can see it's no, nowhere near the B natural. Well, not a big deal. Let's try it again. Okay, my focus is that fifth finger. I well, I'm a little closer right now. I'm in those white keys. Not quite on B, but close enough. One more time. Again, the focus is on exchanging the first finger for the fifth finger. Even doing just that, right? Don't even play the chord, just press it down, feel, okay, I got it. Now all I have to do is move. Better, okay. These sort of motions are very hard to master well. This is what pianists spend their entire careers getting better and better at until they can you know, be all over the keyboard and seemingly have no problem doing that. It only comes through this deliberate practice of specific position jumps where you're very much aware of how to coordinate and you know which keys you have to be particularly aware of as your anchor points and just don't look really looking at your hand is what let me close my eyes closing your eyes is another great way to practice it here i am i need to move down an octave i'm aware of this note i'm, I'm aware of this finger on this key i need to put this finger here in its place let's try it I did it and my eyes were closed. In some sense, I would say eyes closed creates even stronger sensation of that tactile feel and you're not being distracted by the visuals, right? All, all kinds of things that usually get in the way are not there anymore. Okay, so let's keep going. Measure five. Now I'm about, about to play beat three. You know what to do. Finger five there. Now, I'm going to change my position very slightly in measure six. Right, so finger two moves to the A sharp. Finger four is going to play like this on the E. Some uh, smaller sized hands might need to rotate a little bit, but do experiment. It all depends on your individual hand shapes. Whatever you do, let's say it's this shape, which I think is a little harder than being on the edge of the F sharps. But let's say it's this. Same thing applies. You're aware of this key being covered by the fifth finger. There it is. There it is. So whatever you do, just the most important thing is glide that thumb along the black-white border, like was the point in most of the studies in this set. we got to measure seven and you can see that one being exchanged with three while the note is sustained that's a much easier transition than to actually have to jump here you can literally keep holding the F sharp finger one put the third finger there and change your position to the regular B major chord now here you can perhaps justifiably slide back out to the edge of the keys and now a different problem begins because I find that in some way being on the black keys is easier for me. They kind of come out, they have a certain shape to them. Playing on the edge of the white keys, you're suddenly just dealing with this flat surface which is so uniform and the only thing that's helping is the sensation of um, the long fingers touching certain black keys. Right. I know though that's a D sharp and F sharp without having to look because of the distance between those keys. But still the same principle applies. I'm about to move down to play, what is it, measure eight. And I need to be here. Well, how do I find this exact shape without looking down? Same thing, awareness of the thumb on the B where I'm going to put the 
fifth finger B. Right, so as long as I'm aware of these shared keys, it really solves a lot of the problems when it comes to position shifts. Right, it just happens. I'm literally thinking, put five where one is. And if it doesn't work right away, don't don't despair. It just it really does take some time to feel comfortable with, but it will happen. I'm a little bit off B, but I, I'm instantly aware of it. There it is. And same thing in reverse, fifth finger focus. And I slightly missed, so I can practice again. There is five, and I'm about to play one, place one in its place. It's almost missed, but I felt, felt that reference spot. And again, just closed my eyes instantly. So much easier to do it blind. Kind of reminds you of some great blind pianists. In a way, they had the advantage of not having to look at the score. Now here, uh, the last two chords of measure eight, a uh, slightly smaller jump. And as the result, you're aware that you're going to place finger one on where my three is right now. Three is on F sharp. That's where the thumb is going to go. It's a slightly harder move in a way because you're going diagonally into the, from outside to the inside. And I know I missed without having to look because I kind of rushed through it. I didn't give enough attention to the third finger being where it is. Right, so I'm really actively trying to put into my mind the location of the important fingers, reference fingers, anchored fingers, whatever you want to call it. There, that awareness of the three on F sharp and then put in the F uh, first finger in its place. Now let's, let's keep going. Uh, I think, again, unfortunately, my view cut off the top fingers in this view um, in, uh, in the, on the last chord. And it's actually one, two, three, five. And the reason is because I want to save four for the downbeat of measure nine, right? So we go from last beat of measure eight and looks like we are in a better shape keeping the thumb and the fifth finger on the edges of the white keys for the next couple of measures because you can see that i'm having to play g g g always white key but same principle applies let's be aware of the g on the white key oh, i'm sorry be aware of the thumb on the g and put fifth finger in its place a little bit dirty. Let's try it again. And I keep hitting that C. That's, it's a pretty nasty little stretch. So um, I'm almost wondering if you've got a smaller hand, maybe it's okay to drop, let's say, the fourth finger in this first chord. But if, if you've got a big enough hand, try to, try to get it. No, even I can't do it. Now I play the D sharp with finger three, so not an easy chord by any means. Uh, another possibility is what I mentioned earlier. You can rotate or deviate your hand a little bit. You play the G with finger one on the edge, but the fifth finger, you let it slide inside the key a bit. Right? That makes it much easier to play cleanly because you're not playing kind of sideways with finger four there. But maybe it's a question of degree. Maybe you don't need to go that far. Maybe it's somewhere here. Well, still playing the third finger on D sharp for some reason. So keep that third finger up. Oh, that was finally clean, but then I missed my position shift. All right, now let's also be aware of the G on... Uh, fi first finger on the G. Put in the fifth finger there. Ah, finally I got it. Well, just like with any piece, there is going to be a moment that's harder for some reason. And 
I'll tell you what the reason was. I wanted to have that s sudden modulation from B major to C major, right? From here to here. And of course, when you do that, suddenly you're playing a lot of white keys and lo and behold, I have this dominant of C major that's kind of tricky to play. But with a little bit of practice, I think it's doable. Uh, still hitting that C. There it is. So it's a very kind of careful grabbing motion with the tips of my fingers. There it is. So not so much down the whole arm, but use those claw-like actions of the tips of the fingers to grab those notes and move to from this thumb on G to this five on G same shape slight adjustment just the second finger moves again feel at G I'm about to play downbeat of 10 I'm going to put thumb in the place of the fifth finger got it and I could sort of feel that ah, thumb went to G and the other fingers adjusted shortly afterwards. It all happened very quickly, but I could feel that happen. And if you slow it down, I'm still working on, you know, press button kind of slow motion review um, possibility, but not quite yet. One more time, downbeat of 10. About to go down so always be aware I would almost circle those notes I would almost put like a big red circle over each note at the jump which should be focused on when you're doing a jump so circle around beat 3 measure 10 bottom note and I completely missed it now here last beat of measure 10 I need to move back inside the keyboard so that's my move All right and as soon as I find those outside black keys now that's my new position I'm going to be aware of a flat downbeat of measure 11 and notice nope we're not going to put the thumb on that a flat no we're going to put it on the key next to it the F the uh, G flat so we're aware of where A flat is. We know that G flat is right next to it, and that's where we're moving the thumb to. There it is. In some way, I'm finding that easier than if I had to actually put the thumb on, on the A flat. A flat is such a big stretch, and kind of between other black keys, I, f I find putting the thumb on G flat is much easier. There it is shape is of course the same and we're playing the uh, that eighth note passage and about to play the downbeat of 12 yeah so as soon as I play the downbeat of 12 and with before I play the downbeat of 12 I'm aware of that a flat in the thumb because that fifth finger has to go there let's do it again so I'm about to play or let's actually press down the downbeat, right? I'm frozen in that instant in time when I've played the downbeat, but I haven't jumped yet. All right, there's that A flat. There's my fifth finger. That's it. Just focus on one finger only to execute those moves. There, one more time. That's it. So now playing the actual chord. A slight, you know, miss but quickly adjusted to the right position now that's a very very big stretch it might be hard to do it for a smaller hand in which case i would just recommend rolling so, so put your thumb as far down as you can your fifth finger will probably let go of the a, a flat and you just do this Start with the F down below and then continue. The rest of that passage uh, breaks up those chords, so they're perfectly doable. But same thing applies. We're being aware of that e, uh, A flat in finger five, and we're going to put the thumb 
not on A flat, not on G flat like we just did, but on F. So that's a little bit of, uh, you know, spatial awareness of the distance between A flat and F. There it is. Again, I find closing my eyes actually helps me to make that jump with more confidence. I know like right now without looking that I'm touching that G flat. I know the F is right here. So I was a little bit too far. Right, there's that G flat. I'm grabbing it with my thumb and there's the F, right? So still, I would highly recommend not trying to do this. There's going to be a lot of extraneous motion that you don't need to deal with. All right, one more time, uh, measure 13. Right there on that F. And I'm about to jump from um, this F, this, this whole stretched out chord to that previous position down below. What am I actually going to focus on? Because none of the notes that I'm about to move down to, none of those keys are shared. Right, so here and then here, those are completely different keys. So you can continue to feel that gap between F and A flat. That's perfectly reasonable approach. Right, I was aware of where my thumb was on F and I'm aware that A flat is kind of close to F. And I know that I could probably bring my fifth finger over to A flat. So, right, and that's again the first thing that I focus on, putting that reference finger to its key and then let the other fingers ex extend. Another possibility is to be aware that right below F is E flat. And you can actually lead with your third finger. And maybe that distance between F and E flat is small, slightly smaller than from F to A flat. Not, not by much. In fact, it depends how you measure, from which side of F. But maybe the third finger gives you more confidence. Who knows? These are the kinds of things you start to explore in your own body, in your own mind. And you, you, you again, you focus on one reference key and you use it to your advantage. Right, so that was me focusing on finding the E flat by being aware of the fact that E flat is right below the thumb. Right, I know it's the next black key down, whereas up above F there is that G flat in the way. Maybe it's a little bit less secure. One other thing that I think is worth mentioning or pointing out and perhaps if you've tried a couple of these already, it makes sense to glide the hand on the keyboard. A lot of people, when they're more the beginner stage, get taught to do this weird parabola shape, this arc shape to move position. And I think that's the worst thing you can do to learn to change positions confidently. I'm always in contact with the underneath of my palm, with the white keys, you know, this underneath of the knuckle bridge with those black keys. It's always there, always gliding. So that gives me that direct straight line. Uh, passage, right? Pathway to get to the, to the new position. And so even if you press too hard down, you start to actually play those keys, which you don't want. But it's a it's a golden middle. You're you're not quite pressing hard into the, those keys, but you're also not lifting it fully up. Right, I'm always close to the keys. And so on. Anyway, let's continue into measure 14. Here it might make sense to not go back out to the edge of the keyboard because you're then going to go 
pretty quickly to F sharp there in measure 15. So let's try it inside the keyboard. Now, what are, what are we about to pay, pay attention to? Well, a couple of things. That's my current position, but that's not the chord I'm going to go down to. The bottom two notes are also F and B, but the top note is in the new harmony, in the new position. And so I have this kind of transitional position with F and B and then D sharp and F sharp. When I'm up here, if I can still keep my thumb anchored on this F, F sharp area, well, that makes it much easier to find the uh, fifth finger location because it has to go right there. There it is. And then if I find my uh, five, it's very easy to find four because it's the next black key down. That big gap CB makes it very easy for the second finger to find B. And of course the thumb naturally extends down instead of that F sharp, it's down on F right now. So that's the shape in measure 14. And as soon as I hit that D and G, I am aware of how my fifth finger moves from here uh, or from where it is to where my thumb is. There it is. And then other fingers just sort of seem to find their way naturally. Right, and now I'm back in B major area where I was some time ago. Okay, um, and of course here I just need to shift back up and we're back in this very comfortable territory where my fifth finger and my first finger share the same key. Right, so as soon as I get to the end of this passage, I move. Finding the first finger position first and then letting the other fingers fall into place. Ah, let's move the view. Uh, coming up on uh, measure 16. Now here it's a very easy transition, just slide down from F sharp to F and then find the inner notes with the long fingers. Same thing there. I'm aware that I'm changing, exchanging five for where one used to be. And we're now moving back to E flat major, our starting key. That's the fingering I would suggest. You end up on one in the end of measure 16, you're about to play with two, three, four, five in measure 17. And we're really r ratcheting up those position changes. As soon as you play that two, three, four, five chord, downbeat of 17, guess which finger is being replaced. Right, and now you kind of have to find that position. First finding the thumb. I'm finding that despite the difficulty of playing those um, inner voices, inner sounds deep inside the key, it still seems to make sense to do it in the context of this passage. Just, you know, you put the thumb right next to the black keys and you find the other keys with the long fingers. And then you're right next to those E flats, so it makes it much easier to transition. Now on the third beat of 17, same thing, you're aware of the thumb. And you put your fifth finger in its place. Then keep inside the keyboard. I would just use one, two, four, five. Seems like it makes sense. But as soon as you hit it, fifth finger is replaced. This interesting shape, one, two, three, four, five. Which finger? This one. That's the one that replaced it. Okay, let's move the view to measure what 19 here. And we start moving the thumb. And finally changing our chord. Always being aware of that fifth finger being replaced with one 
if replaced with one and I'm having to now finally lean to follow my right arm because I'm so far below to give me space to work here that I actually need to kind of lean over, roll over a bit on my chair to be able to play those high notes. Now here, I'm about to leap down and the shared note is B flat being replaced with finger five. You'll notice it's being played. This, this position is broken up into two parts, the finger one and the other fingers. But the position, that feeling of B flat under finger one remains even as I play those long fingers. So that's how I, I'm able to replace finger one on B flat with finger five on B flat. In this particular case, we have to DC Alcoda. So again, the same instruction as before. You play this chord and then quickly put second finger on B flat so that you can then, blah, 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 there it is, be ready to play the downbeat of the beginning. Whoops, I missed it because was I aware of that E flat? Of course not. There it is. Now I got it. All right, and then we get to the end of this line, just before the coda. All right, feeling that chord. And now, before I do anything, I will be jumping to coda. Now, the only difference between the chord I've got ready and this coda downbeat is this is major, and that coda, I'm just gonna transpose it down an octave, is minor, that's the only difference. But the outside notes and the A flat there, all the same stuff. So, fifth finger. And now. This final stretch is a little bit reminiscent of Etude 4 with all these uh, different mm, uh, chord inversions. Kind of doing this. Right, all of this stuff where you invert through the same harmony down down and what's obviously much easier about this uh, cascading is that you are sharing so many notes that now I'm aware of the fact that let's say the first chord the downbeat finger one is going to be replaced with what finger well it's two then the thumb plays on that C flat and of B2 and it's going to be replaced with finger two again. Again, the thumb is playing A flat, about to be replaced with two. Now, some people like this sort of fingering. You can experiment, you can try either three or the fourth finger. Whatever seems better for your hand, use that. So then in measure 22, to find that F flat major chord is quite easy. It's right next to that E flat where my thumb is currently located. But then same principle applies. I'm exchanging the first finger with the second finger. same stuff I kept my thumb gliding down this black white border line now that E flat I still have it under my second finger I'm about to place well you decide some people like to play octaves like this with one three for some people it has to be one four you can also do the traditional one five Either way, to find this is easy. However, those final two chords, maybe not so easy. And here I give you absolute license to, unless you want to be really cool and uh, practice these kind of leaps uh, blind, uh, you can absolutely just remember it's a typical E flat major chord here and here. And look down and finish the piece with the aid of your eyes. 
something like that. Anyway, so hopefully this helped. I do think it's probably the hardest study. And I, again, the reason I wrote it was because of my arrangement of But Not For Me by Gershwin. Uh, and in the last section, I did have some of this sort of material where I was trying to make the texture a little more concerto-like, a little more full, so it sounds a little bit like you're playing with both hands, even though you're only using one hand. So created a little bit of a difficulty, which I tried to work out in this etude. But that brings us to the end of these six studies. Hopefully it gives uh, a little bit of fun material, whatever the word fun means in this context. But uh, I think some of them are pretty good as standalone short miniatures that can be good additions to right hand only repertoire. Anyway, let me know what you thought about these studies in the comments and if they are in fact good additions to the right hand repertoire. Enjoy.